Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, welcome back to the show. Jim, pleasure to be back on the show. Today we're going to uh, treat our audience to some uh, lithium bottom fish stocking stuffers. John, Lithium Mania 2.0 has been a frequent theme on Kaiser Watch during the second half of 2022, though you have not said much about specific companies. You've pointed out Lithium Bottom Fish to your Kaiser Research Online members who pay $450 per year, but now you want to introduce a few as year-end stocking stuffers for our Kaiser Watch audience. Why do you believe Lithium will excite the market more than gold in 2023? Well, the... Bottom fish uh, stocking stuffers are lithium exploration juniors, fairly early stage, which I believe could perform in the manner that Patriot Battery Metals did this year when it's a Corvette project in the James Bay region, which they began drilling in March, uh, delivered results of long intersections of 1 to 2% lithium oxide that the market immediately began to do the back of the napkin numbers and, and recognize, wow, these are substantial pegmatite bodies. And this stock, which started there 40, 50 cents at the beginning of the year, hit a high of 1050 in early January, where it had a $1.3 billion valuation. Now, the collection of um, uh, lithium bottom fish that I've assembled, and I'm only going to uh, uh, share a few of them as stocking stocking stuffers. They have market caps of from $40, $50 million all the way to below $10 million. And they are being priced as simple expiration juniors without much expectation of success. However, Lithium Mania 2.0 is all about this pegmatite hunt. And Patriot Battery Metals has shown how rapidly big audiences and retail investors can respond to evidence of a significant new discovery much faster, in fact, than is typical for a gold exploration play where initial results, unless they are truly monster intersections in a geological context already well understood, only get a bit of an encouraging market response in this current bear market uh, we have. Now, retail investors, uh, uh, they, they... heard about lithium during what I call Lithium Mania 1.0, which ran from 2015 to 2018. That was a period when uh, lithium prices had gone to the uh, into the 10 to 15 dollars per pound lithium carbonate, and uh, many of these sort of more advanced projects that you know, pegmatites that people had understood brine plays, they managed to uh, catch an audience. Did okay during that period. But then the Australians were so successful in mobilizing new supply from all their pegmatite bodies that they oversupplied the uh, demand from the the electric vehicle sector. And we saw the lithium price crash back to uh, below $3 a pound in 2018-20. And most people have this negative memory of what this was all about. Yeah, it came and went. I, I missed it. But those advanced juniors which managed to struggle through this uh, period where their projects weren't that particularly uh, uh, worth worth developing. When the imbalance reversed in 2021 and lithium carbonate prices began to rise, they have since uh, achieved a tenfold increase from that level. They're at around $35 a pound right now, which is too high for the long run but it's well above the sort of $10, $15 a pound range, which is what is believed to be necessary to mobilize a tenfold expansion of lithium supply over the next 10, 10, 15 years in order for new electric vehicle car sales to completely replace internal combustion engine car sales by 2035. And, uh, and, and right now, the next three years are the window where the car makers who have started to understand, uh, oh, where is that, all this lithium supposed to come from? Uh, this, this, the next three years, it has to be identified. And it's much tougher to figure it out with claystone deposits and brine deposits because there's a lot of uh, processing technology that needs to be applied to flow sheet fine-tune to get rid of the impurities, to, to figure out how to extract the lithium from the 
from the brine. So with the, those types of projects, it's hard to do a back of the napkin calculation based on, you know, a, a set of drill holes and assay grades. And, you know, when you, from, from a discovery hole to the first economic study, it's only two years for a pigment type play. And in fact, like Patriot, uh, I mean, it's been sitting on these Corvette pigment types uh, since 2015, 16, and picked them up during lithium mania uh, uh, 1.0, but it never really got anything done during during that period because the lithium price collapsed and this is a remote location and the market didn't really quite believe that electric vehicles would take off the way that they have. But this this has completely changed and they will, by middle of next year, have a resource estimate out and we'll be doing a combination of a feasibility demonstration to show you know, what does it cost to, to mine uh, uh, these pegmatites in this James Bay region, and also continuing to delineate additional bodies just to show whoever wants to ultimately develop this how much lithium-enriched pegmatite tonnage is actually present on this project so that different scales of development uh, can be um, applied depending on you know the, how well the uh, lithium demand does evolve. Now, when... When the lithium carbonate price took off uh, late last year and continued to take off this year, the institutional audience, they understood why. They real, realized that the car makers had gone past the point of no return. And there were also uh, policy-driven mandates created, uh, which uh, pretty much forced car companies to replace their ICE car sales by 2035 in Europe and in the United States and, and other Western Western cu countries. And so they understood that, uh, uh, okay, this demand growth is going to be real. It guarantees that $10, $15 a pound is going to be a long-term reality because below that, the, 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 the lithium just won't become available. And, uh, of course, at the... Uh, $35 a pound, it's the, the lithium demand also won't evolve because in order for EVs to replace ordinary uh, combustion engine cars, they need to be affordable. And at those levels, the, the cars are not going to be affordable. So expecting a price retreat is something that you don't normally uh get your head around when you're dealing with metal expiration, but it is a, a, a reality. And all these advanced companies like Sigma Lithium, they're all being priced on the basis of a long-term $10, $15 a pound basis. Now, retail investors think, well, we missed the boat on those. These stocks like uh, like Sigma Lithium went from 5 bucks to $50 in this period, uh, very well financed by institutional capital. But this is just the advance guard of a whole range of future lithium producers that is required to make this reality. And I think over the next three years, because of the nature of pegmatite expiration, the, the car makers are going to be supportive. Uh, larger audiences are going to be uh, very interested in seeing where all these deposits are and what will it take to get them into production by 2030. Because the Lithium Mania 2.0 is not about delivering lithium over the next five years. It's delivering the second half of that expected tenfold expansion, and the gains that are possible for these types of bottom fish, they, they are you know, very, very uh, extraordinary. Now, the, you asked the question about why I think it will be more interesting than gold. And what one really needs to think about is the value expansion of lithium. Uh, you go back to uh, uh, even as recent as 2005, the annual lithium market was worth only a couple hundred million, couple hundred million dollars. And, uh, since then, it spiked to 9.6 billion in 2018 when lithium was there in that 10 to 15 dollar range, collapsed back to, uh, uh just under 3 billion dollars in, in, uh, in 2020. But last year, at the average 15 dollar a pound price, uh, it was worth $18 billion. And this year, it's going to be worth somewhere between 
30 and 40 billion dollars uh, that, that won't have been what companies uh, received because they were probably locked into long-term lower prices, but those long-term contracts are, are going to be gone. But if you consider that this the supply last year of 100,000 tons of lithium metal, um, and, and you take the price range of uh, 10 to $15 a pound for lithium carbonate uh, uh, equivalent, and, uh, and then expand that tenfold to a million tons, we're looking at a market that by 2032, 35 could be worth 120 to 180 billion dollars a year. Now, c- compare that with uh, with with gold. I mean, gold 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 was producing about two billion dollars worth of uh, gold in 1972 when it was still 35 dollars and an ounce, and uh, when it jumped to 800 and then settled back at $400 by 1980. Uh, the annual production was worth anywhere from 15 to 25 billion from 1980 to 2002. And it was only in uh, 2010 that it, it managed to leap above $100 billion. And last year, all the gold produced was worth $173 billion. But it took 30 years for the value of annual gold supply to increase from 20 billion to 100 billion. And during that period, the mining industry doubled the above ground stock to about six and a half billion ounces. And that's, that's worth about 12 trillion dollars today. And if you take 1980 gold, uh, $400 gold 1980 and inflation adjusted to the present, the equivalent price is $1,434 a day, which even around the $1,800 price, that represents a 25% real gain. But consider what we're facing with lithium. We've gone from sort of a $2 to $4 range that prevailed forever when lithium was just used for for the glassware and ceramics industry and other sort of uh, industrial processes. Uh, now it's going to, it's at $35. It's going to, it's up tenfold from that range. It'll end up being up fivefold in, in real price terms, uh, very rapidly all happening and happened in the last five years. This is a staggeringly huge market. And just like in the 80s, the juniors had an excellent time as they looked at all these low-grade oxide deposits in Nevada and applied heat leaching, uh, began to look at wider, lower-grade zones elsewhere in Archean greenstone belts and start mining a lower grade. All of this was made possible by the substantial real price gold gains that happened back in, ni- in that period from 1972 to 1980. And right now, to, for gold to get a meaningful real gain, or like even to double to get to uh, $4,000 an ounce, I'm not sure what sort of circumstances would enable a an asset class that's worth 12 trillion dollars to uh, say become worth 24 trillion dollars. So for the idea of uh, suddenly a lot of low hanging, high hanging fruit becoming low hanging fruit as a result of a real metal price gain, I just don't see that happening with gold. And yet, if gold crosses to 2,000, maybe gets to 2,200, the market will be excited. But that's really not enough for the ounces in the ground type plays that may be struggling at the current price. They need a much bigger real price gain. It's excellent for gold exploration because there you're trying to find something that works with the price that you have. So so I think uh, gold crossing through 2000 and 2023 will be helpful for those. But it won't be helpful in the same way that the situation, the higher lithium price and the growth in demand uh, will be for the pegmatite hunters. So this is what got me so excited about Lithium Mania 2.0, this almost necessary 100 to $200 billion market that has to grow over the next 10 years that's going to be to some degree recession-proof because these car companies are going to continue to plan their EV replacement of ICE cars, and the mining industry has to work on this right now so that they can see which deposits will be developed when to feed the future need. And the retail investors don't quite understand how huge this is. The institutional audience is looking at the more advanced ones when something like uh, Patriot 
battery metals comes up with the, 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 the right intersection showing that we have significant tonnage and, and a grade that's going to work very well at 10 to $15 a pound lithium carbonate, then they will move in in a big way. And so this whole thing's set up for a tremendous pegmatite exploration boom. And these stocking stuffers that I've, uh, I'm going to introduce today are all in some way involved in pegmatite exploration. Why do you like Brunswick Exploration? Brunswick Exploration is the uh, first sort of bottom fish junior in the lithium space that I personally began to buy. Uh, this, this was a shell company uh, that Bob Wares controlled. It was supposed to be involved in DMS exploration in, in New Brunswick. It had a bunch of hand-me-down projects from the Cisco Metals, which was focused on its Pine Point zinc lead Lead, lead project um, in, in the Northwest Territories, but uh, Bob himself had thought he had missed the boat with lithium. Uh, you know, he, 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 he saw the price go up, and he saw stocks like Frontier Lithium uh, go from you know thirty cents to to four or five dollars. And uh, but when he started digging into, okay, what what's this pegmatite stuff all about? You know, he he worked his way up the learning curve and started researching Eastern Canada's uh, um, greenstone belts and settings where you have these uh, potential for pegmatites. And pegmatite bodies have been observed many, many places as a byproduct of base and precious metals exploration. Because the, the annual market was only worth a couple hundred million dollars for decades, nobody really, really cared about them because a few of the big Chilean brines they supplied a good chunk of the world's lithium and a giant deposit in Western Australia called Greenbushes. It supplied the rest. And with these two scalable supply sources, uh, nobody bothered with smaller pegmatite deposits that were lithium enriched. So they were noticed but ignored because they just weren't, the, the, it, the, there was no demand that could accommodate any meaningful increase of supply from these sources. But the car sector, that electric vehicle uh, energy transition strategy, that has changed everything. And so Brunswick, uh, Bob Wares and uh, his uh, co-person, uh, uh, Killian Charles, they went through the archives, they checked out everything, uh, they, they saw all these areas that were open, and yes, the, the ones that were like really sticking out of the ground that had been uh, found many decades ago by you know various uh, geologists and even geoscientists. Uh, those were already owned, but the idea of looking for m more of them within the trend, nobody was on top of it. So they did substantial staking activity in Quebec, in Atlantic Canada, and also in Ontario. They have su assembled a huge portfolio. They put boots on the ground. They had an XRF gun with which they would shoot for rubidium to uh, uh, distinguish the LCT type of pegmatite that uh, would have a lithium content from the, uh, the barren uh, uh, pegmatites that would not have any of it. And so they used this big process of elimination and generated numerous targets. And on the Hearst project, which they spent almost eight months tying up because they were able to stake part, but they had to deal on the other part, that they will start drilling in the end of January, and they will have multiple projects uh, scheduled for, for target testing in, in 2023. They will have $10 million in the Treasury by the end of 22, 2022, so they do not need to finance to execute on this program, and they plan to be like have multiple pegmatite discoveries in many different areas, the big coup that Bob was able to pull off uh, in the last couple of months was to auction several projects from the Osisco Mining Group. Uh, these were projects which uh, had been uh, generated by Virginia Mines after it was spun out from Virginia Gold. And again, they were looking for gold. They had staked these claims. They had gold potential. But they also cover pegmatite trends, which are often parallel with where the gold splays are. So they have a 90% auction on several projects, one which is basically a projection of uh, Patriot Batteries uh, Corvette uh, trend uh, in, in, in the northern part of James Bay, and the other in that area, the, the, the so-called James Bay uh, field where 
or galaxy had acquired uh, the field that was discovered by, by lithium lithium one and they acquired that company, Palmatizic's company, and and they, they and it's now owned by Allcam, which is advancing it. And so they Brunswick has managed to option nearby ground, which appears to be the continuation of pegmatite trends. So Brunswick exploration is my favorite and literally it will be part of the 2023 favorites list as my uh, uh, you know big grassroots uh, pegmatite exploration champion. It's got great people. They have the incentive. They have the know-how. And that's the one which I think will be the, the leader coming out of the shoot in 2023. Why do you like Dios exploration? I have followed a Dios exploration for a couple decades. It was spun out from serious resources in 2002 to hold the uh, the diamond exploration uh, uh, property surrounding Ashton's Renard discovery, also in the James Bay area of uh, central Quebec. And it's run by Marie-José Girard. And amazingly, this company still only has about 130, 40 million shares fully diluted over the 20 years without ever doing a rollback. And that's quite a rarity amongst juniors. And they have specialized in the James Bay area. And where they have had their attention in the last couple of years is in the K2 property, which wraps around this uh, this intrusion that's to the southwest of Azimut's uh, Elmore project, where it has the Patwan gold uh, gold discovery, a high-grade uh, uh, a deposit, and they had they did a drill program a, a year or so ago at the western end. The, the results weren't particularly interesting. This year they uh, drilled at the southern flank of this intrusion, and we're awaiting assays. Uh, they got funded by some flow-through funds, and uh, they, there's, they they managed to. They're not quite sure what type of a uh, deposit setting this is. It could be VMS. Uh, they have sulfides in the core, but they've also seen specks of gold in the core, which uh, suggests that there are multiple phases of, of uh, activity going on in this thing. So we're wait, waiting to see if this thing, the K2 project, is, uh, is, is alive. But we're almost hoping that the results are only so-so and that they don't spend mo- more money on this uh, project. Because what they did... What 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 what, what Marie Jose Girard did this year was the Alberto O33 project that they had in the James Bay area. They had dropped half of it because the northern half uh, turned out to have just these pegmatite bodies and not be quite as prospective for these high-grade gold veins that they were chasing on that project. And as she's watching all this unfold with the pegmatite boom this year. In a, in a way similar to Bob, where she's saying these things might be really worth something. And in fact, Sirius, uh, when she was with Sirius, they had found the Pontax uh, lithium deposit, uh, uh, which is now uh, owned by Stria Lithium, which is funded out to Cygnus Gold and, and Australian listed companies. So she went back in there and restaked what she calls Lithium 33, where they had observed all these uh, bodies. Uh, uh, outcropping, but had never done anything with it because the, uh, you know, you know, the pegmatite, the lithium pegmatites weren't interesting. And the whole area has rubidium anomalies in the, uh, lake, uh, bottom sediments, which are a clue that, uh, the, the pegmatites in the area are lithium enriched. And so they state that, but they also did, uh, uh, analysis of the, uh, lake bottom sediment, uh, data that the government had generated several years earlier and and over a very large region to the south. And were able to use their experience with the glacial history of the James Bay region that was developed through all the work they did looking for indicator minerals, trying to find kimberlite pipes that were outside the cluster that uh, that Ashton had, had discovered and staked, and were able to identify a train it wasn't like an indicator mineral train, but it was more like a train of anomalies in a series of lakes because this part of uh, Quebec is just full of water bodies. And they traced it to an area that they announced recently called Nemescow North. And it's uh, between a couple of uh, blocks uh, 
uh, to the west there is Kenora Lands Project, which was sold to Lyft Power. And uh, to the east is a block that Brunswick owns. However, they staked that ages ago for, um, for VMS potential, so we don't know what's there. But their analysis of the known sources of, uh, of pegmatite, such as the Rose Project of Critical Elements, and the, 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 the projects to the west, they really say this thing has, an, has a source in this area where there's very little outcrop, you go farther up ice, and the rubidian anomalies disappear from the uh, lake bottom sediment. And so they stake this, and this will be something that they will get tackle in, in 2023. So it's very early stage. Uh, I'm not sure they got boots on the ground uh, to check out lithium-33, but they will in 2023. And that whole area, it, it's to the northwest of the Critical Elements Rose Project, which um uh, they are now in the permitting permitting stage, and the, the thing with these past explorations, they would find a, an outcropping pegmatite, and they would limit their exploration to sorting this out. Now the view is uh, there's a lot more going on. You sometimes need to peel back the moss uh, and and look a little closer for more subtle evidence of a hidden pegmatite body still exposed at surface, but not visible from some satellite. Imagery. So, so Dios has just raised another 650,000. They were able to do it without warrants at the, at 10 cents. So it's in good shape. And that's again a, a stocking stuffer for the James Bay region, which also could surprise everybody with the K2 assays when they become available in January. Why do you like Explore Resources Corp? Explore Resources is Wes Hansen's company at the completed uh, uh, a qualifying transaction of a, a CPC a couple of years ago. It was originally focused more on gold exploration in northwestern uh, Ontario, so the south of the Red Lake District. But the, one of the projects that they staked, uh, the Surge project, uh, it also has uh, pegmatite potential. In fact, it's on trend with the whole sort of boot lake uh, uh, projects or root root lake projects that uh, Green Metals Tech, uh, uh, the Australian listed company, has been exploring this year to the west. And but but what really in, uh, attracted me to explore earlier this year when I started accumulating it as a bottom fish was that uh, he Wes Hansen has a history of working in Brazil and had some familiarity with it and had done a deal with some. Uh, uh, academics in Brazil to help him find gold prospects in Brazil. And they did try to find some greenstone hosted gold prospects, but they were always owned by somebody else and the asking price was, was, was too high. But when he started earlier this year, started seeing this uh, lithium, you know, price trend and, and, and the underlying narrative, uh, he told these guys, go back to your drawing board, to all your academic uh, uh, files on that and check out the uh, the, the lithium districts, and of course, Sigma Lithium is in Minas Gerais. That's where its big project project is. They hit a four and a half, five billion dollar valuation this year, based on a 90 million ton resource, uh, only a portion of which is scheduled to go into production. So Explore has picked up on uh, uh, claims in that area, but that's not as interesting as the Bombera. Uh, uh, pegmatite uh, uh, province in the northern part of Brazil, where the, this has never really been looked at for, uh, for, 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 for for lithium, but the pegmatites are there. They are LCT pegmatites, and they've been picking up claims in that area. It's an area that's being swarmed by uh, Australian companies because the Australians completely get it. They're way ahead of the Canadians in understanding the implications of lithium mania 2.0. And uh, so there are additional projects that Explore will acquire to give it a significant footprint in Brazil. But what uh, intrigued me recently was uh, they did do some send a field crew out onto the surge property east of um, the, the, the Root Lake uh, project area, and they were able to find pegmatites and collect samples, and uh, they still don't have assays yet. But they found this... Uh, the, 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 the field crew found a one and a half kilometer long, it wasn't very wide, but it was a massive sulfide zone that's right between the uh, peruminous granite and a structural fault, which uh, 
uh, could be a gateway for uh, fluids at some point, have been a gateway. And the magnetics suggest that there's banded iron formation present in this area. And they, of course, followed the one and a half kilometers of several meter wide massive sulfites, took samples, uh, uh, saw some calcopyrite in it, no idea if there's any gold. There's not really supposed to be any gold potential uh, south of this fault area. And so this could be something very interesting. The, the, the magnetics become much more busy and folded to the western projection of this linear trend. So West thinks this is an area which has undergone folding, which is always a better place for banded iron formation deposits to form. So we could end up having a, a, a serendipity event where these massive sulfites that are undocumented actually contain gold and represent a, uh, uh, a banded iron formation type gold discovery in an area where they aren't really known to exist. So the company needs to raise 400 grand U.S. for its Brazilian play. It needs to raise 600 grand for its uh, Canadian play uh, late, you know, for, to resume work next year. They'd like to begin right away in in Brazil. So it's, it's a sort of five to seven cent stock because uh, it doesn't really have a significant audience yet and needs to get into a better price range as people understand the potential here. And Wes is obviously hoping for the assay results to confirm that the uh, pegmatite outcrops on surge are indeed decent grade and to see what this massive sulfide zone is all about, which could end up becoming the priority target as a byproduct of what started out as a lithium exploration program. Why do you like Lodestar battery metals? Lodestar battery metals is a rescue operation of a company that acquired uh, several several uh, silver Mexican silver deposits from Silver One. It was a company called uh, Plymouth Plymouth Realty. It was a CPC. It had never really uh, gotten anything going. Ended up in the, in the inactive uh, NEX board. But several years ago, it was rolled back ten for one. Tobias Treasure, who is the uh, manager of the Zurich-based Global Commodities Global Fund. Uh, he ended up uh, rounding up places for 10 million shares at 10 cents, for which he got a 750,000 share finder's fee. And then the company did uh, sort of an RTO of the silver assets from Silver One, which is the largest uh, you know, single shareholder in the company. It was financed by a couple of brokerage firms at 80 cents. Uh, they raised nine, nine, ten million dollars. Uh, spent two thirds of it, and the stock crashed and burned. They didn't seem to produce any particularly interesting, interesting results. And uh, uh, Lowell, Lowell Cannon was uh, brought in by whoever it was that was the bag holder for this uh, mess. Got him in there to clean up, uh, change the management, and pivot the company into the lithium space. And they picked up the uh, Penny project, which uh, extends the, the, the trend of uh, in, in the Snow Lake area of, of Manitoba, where the, the Thompson Brothers project uh, is under exploration by Snow Lake Lithium, which is a NASDAQ listed company spun out from a uh, an Australian company. And his goal is to completely change the focus. They'll have several million dollars in the treasury. Uh, they did a sampling program this fall. They, they don't expect the assays uh, until, you know, sometime early in the second quarter of next year. But they've cleaned up the, uh, the structure. Uh, the stock is still relatively cheap uh, because they're still disgruntled silver shareholders. And they're busy uh, trying to get this uh, historic 10 million ounce silver deposit uh, uh, get a 43-101 resource estimate uh, done for, for next year, and then monetize it by selling it to a silver company so that they can be exclusively focused on the lithium potential that they're chasing in, at, at the Plain Penny project in, in, in northern Manitoba. And who knows what other acquisitions are up the sleeve. So it's one of these companies, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a rescue operation of a failed silver story with people behind them in the background who want this thing resurrected. And uh, that, that again, it's, it's, it's more of an old-fashioned type of junior where they seem to have the structure under control. They're refocusing it into a space that's going to be topical. There's, there's countless, you know, Mexican silver plays uh, 
you have to have a really good project to actually stand out. But the lithium space is one that's, although there's a couple hundred companies in it, most of them don't have any meaningful projects that are based on actual understanding of pegmatite trends. Why do you like Searchlight Resources? Now, Searchlight Resources is a collaboration between Stephen Wallace, the geologist, and Al Stewart, the former broker, also a geologist. And their original focus with Searchlight, I mean, the total focus is Saskatchewan, but the original focus was to consolidate uh, these, these gold mining claims west of Flin Flon, uh, what they call the Bootleg Lake District. And everybody was always mesmerized by the, the VMS copper, copper mine deposits uh, uh, in the Flin Flon area. The gold, orogenic gold, was only half-heartedly pursued. So they spent a fair amount of time and effort acquiring these claims, stitching them together. But uh, uh, a couple of years ago, when they couldn't get anybody really interested in the gold plays, again, with the gold play, you have to have an outstanding result to get the market to care because everybody has a has a gold play. But they had also staked the Cool Lake Lake Rare Earth Project, which uh, Eagle Claims at one point owned. And this is a high-grade system of monazite. And, uh, and only the academics have really ever done anything with it. It's, it's the lightweight. Monazite is a lightweight rare earth uh, mineral. But uh, they flew a, a uh, radiometric survey uh, last year, and this revealed a significant thorium anomaly well beyond the known areas next to Coolidge Lake where the uh, monazite had been sampled and trenched in the past. And they get some extremely high grade, 15% plus in that area. But also to the south was a uranium anomaly, not just a thorium. Thorium is associated with these rare earth systems. And they, they, they appear to have a, a low-grade uh, uranium system to the south. That's not quite as interesting as the, uh, as the Kulik Lake rare earth system because if they can show that there's reasonably continuous zones of good grade uh, light rare earth, and of course with light rare earth deposits, 90% of the value resides in the Perseodymium and the Neodymium, the two key, key magnet rare earths, they will have a potential uh, feasibility demonstration play. They had some access problems this year, and uh, they will try to get in there again and do some drilling to show that there's a substantial body. But what's got me intrigued for Searchlight as a pegmatite hunter is that Stephen Wallace has been watching the Jam Lake pegmatite field. Uh, it, it's located about you know, 75 kilometers west of Flin Flon. It, it's north of this Hanson Lake cluster of, of, of beryllium type of uh, pegmatites, which they have farmed out 50% of private party, which was looking at it for VMS potential. But this land to the east has a series of pegmatite sheets that have never been properly assessed and have simply been assumed to be not interesting. And this ground was held by one of these um, sort of stakers who isn't an exploration geologist who stakes what appears to be interesting land, tries to farm it out, and lets it lapse when the you know, assessment work comes due and they haven't been able to interest anything. And as soon as this came free, Searchlight pounced on the Jam Lake project. And this is a substantial area with many pegmatite sheets outcropping that they will put boots on the ground in the, when, in, in, in the spring when, when, when the snow clears and start checking it out. We don't know for sure that these are going to be LCT type uh, pegmatites, but, but the thing with these pegmatite fields, because pegmatites have been so uninteresting, many parts of Canada that have pegmatites, they haven't even bothered to assess what kind of pegmatite it is. So the main upside is from the Cool Lake Lake project. If gold takes off, there will be interest in Bootleg Lake. And uh, but but the, the wild card is that they've managed to stake a significant LCT type field of pegmatites. And once they confirm that, well, then it becomes just a matter of drilling them off, finding the widest of these sheets, and showing that here we have so and so many tons of this. And that's the whole business of lithium mania 2.0. Find your pegmatite body where it's outcropping or barely outcropping. Drill it to show that it's got size and uh, and, and a grade of 1% plus lithium oxide. 
and you're away to the races in 2023 as part of the whole Lithium Mania 2.0. And that wraps up my uh, stocking stuffer offerings for the end of 2022, heading into 2023. John, have a great and prosperous 2023. Thank you very much, Jim. And we hope the same for all our, our watchers uh, of Kaiser Watch uh, in heading into 2023. I'm Jim Goddard. Happy New Year. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.